Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor T. Jayaraman from Tata Institute of Social Sciences and we'll discuss the climate change issues, particularly with the impending negotiations in Paris. Jayaraman, there have been pledges now made by different countries in Paris. Looking at the ambition of those pledges, it does appear it does not even address half the requirement that is there for addressing urgently the climate change crisis that is emerging. So what can we expect out of Paris? Do you think we can expect an agreement which will address the issue or do you think we'll get a, at the best a weak agreement? The situation is currently that if you look at the pledges that the uh, developed countries have made, they amount to so little that uh, if we really want a good uh, sort of you know chance of ensuring that we avoid uh, dangerous climate change then uh, uh, you know the amount of emissions that they want to have will exhaust the global carbon budget by 2030 so 2030. they are by 2030 if things go on as they are 75 percent of the carbon budget which is available between now and 2100 will be exhausted by 2030. And the chief culprits in this, if I may say that, uh, India will uh, spend, uh, uh, is unlikely to consume uh, anything more than 7 or 8 percent of this uh, amount which will be spent by 2030, the bulk of it being developed uh, countries. And, uh, you know, as a consequence, they are taking the uh, lion's share when, in fact, they should be cutting back sharply. Which means that future development of countries which have not yet started really the development cycle, a lot of the what are called the LDCs today, the least, least developed countries, will really not have an opportunity to develop using cheap energy. That means they will have to really expend much more capital in order to meet their energy needs. Is that what we are looking at? Basically, yes, except that I would say that you must add to the list not only the LDCs but also India. So I think uh, uh, if, uh, the, uh, if such a real percentage of uh, safe carbon budget is exhausted by uh, uh, 2030, then those who develop much more slowly will have to do so as time progresses through ever more uh, increasingly expensive uh, pathways. Now, the other issue still remains that if it is exhausted by 2030, 75 percent of the budget, by two, 2040, 2045, the most of the carbon budget would be actually not only ex uh, finished, but we will be overshooting it. So, the, what about the risk to the climate itself? Because what we're really saying is not just exhaustion, the exhaustion of the carbon budget, but also that the two degree, so-called two degree target, is not going to be met. So, I think uh, if uh, we are proceeding at the current rate of uh, ambition, and this persists for some time then uh, we are going to need, so to speak, a bigger carbon budget. And then the probability that we will not cross 2 degrees centigrade goes down. So it's more likely we will cross 2 degrees centigrade. So the countries which are developing slowly and will have more expensive pathways to energy sufficiency for their people will also face the brunt of a heavier load of adaptation. That's an interesting point you make because it's also agreed that the impact of the climate change is going to be felt much more in the countries of the global south than in the countries of the global north. Africa is already showing certain signs of climate distress, as are also certain zones in India. So already this is on the, on the cards. Coming back to Paris negotiations, the other issue which have also been, uh, has also been uh, debated, discussed, and been matters of controversy is the equity principle common but differentiated responsibility would be one aspect of it. Do you think that equity is on the table or has it gone off the table in Paris? Uh, equity has not entirely gone off the table, but if developing countries don't have their wits about them, 
uh, if they do not exert themselves, then equity is in serious danger of disappearing of the table. The problem really is that uh, while a equity or the slogan of equity has often been used in a defensive way, the developing countries have still to put forward a, a positive vision or view of how equity is to be achieved and the insufficiency of that is making their case weaker. So, one hopes that uh, the proposals from countries like Bolivia, etc., for an equitable sharing of the global carbon budget, I hope that is sort of uh, picked up by other developing countries. If so, we have a chance of putting equity back on the table. India, which was one of the strongest proponents of equity earlier, seems to have muted its voice very much with this respect. It in fact did not make, uh, it in fact did not address the Bolivian proposals, did not encourage it either. So, do you think all of this is an indication that US uh, centric foreign policy, strategic policy of the government is also playing itself out in, in the climate change negotiations? And this is not something which is specific to the Modi government, this is also something Vajpayee government and the Manmohan Singh government seems to have done. See, I would say that uh, when it comes to climate policy, the uh, India's position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the government of India's position vis-a-vis -vis the United States has been somewhat at variance with its positions on many other issues. So, even though we are, uh, India is supposed to be a strategic partner, supposed to collaborate on defense and other issues, there is the nuclear deal, all of that notwithstanding, India has uh, been critical of the United States, muted perhaps, but in the negotiations clearly on the other side. Now, one hopes that this continues because I think. Uh, uh, India's interests and I think there is uh, even for governments there is a realization that if you look at the sheer size and the scale of development deficits in India, there is uh, you know we need adequate uh, carbon space and we need to keep temperatures as uh, well below uh, you know uh, the probability of crossing 2 degree centigrade to be limited so that our adaptation burden is not high. So, you know you cannot quite avoid that. So, I think uh, on this I on this issue I would say that uh, uh, they are uh, they are driven in a slightly different way. And, uh, but, uh, you know, one has to see how matters evolve at uh, Paris. Last point, there is a lot of talk of this co-benefits as an approach. Now, I am nothing against co-benefits, yes, if saving the climate saves uh, or benefits certain, gives certain other benefits to society, that is a different issue. But it seems to be the global capital's argument that we can only save the climate if we also get profits from activities of saving the climate. Do you think that is the basis of the co-benefit argument that we must be incentivized in other ways to save the world? I think there are uh, three strikes against co-benefits. What is the first one? The question is not how much in terms of climate action you can afford to do you must find out how much climate action you need to do and then of course, you must do it in the best possible way, the least expensive way and so on and so forth. So, that is point number one. Co-benefits does not come to the problem from that direction at all. The second thing is co-benefits the way it is floated at the level of cities, you deal with pollution, you deal with this. Uh, in, uh, no, in uh, you know, uh, like Mumbai or uh, in, cities. in cities or uh, uh, in agriculture, etc. Co-benefits is a way sometimes of uh, mixing up mitigation and adaptation. So while people are, uh, you tell the developing countries you are doing adaptation, you also try to sneak some mitigation onto them. Now. In principle, this is okay, but if we have a definite ceiling on how much emissions we are allowed, so that within that we can 
plan, look forward and uh, scenario build the least expensive pathways. Within that, if you do co-benefit, that's a different story. But that's not what is happening at present. So it's trying to outflank national governments by using the genuine concern that people have on both pollution and climate to sneak a little bit of mitigation onto developing countries while they are also doing adaptation. The third, of course, is the larger uh, issue. So you have to be persuaded that climate is uh, a climate action is good for you. Now, I don't see why this is a necessity in India. Uh, there is no large scale. Uh, there may be ignorance of the climate issue. People may not be aware of all its subtleties. But we do not have, it is a cross-cutting issue in parliament, that there is no strong uh, climate denying political force in this country. In the Europe, in Europe, this is a problem. Uh, but uh, much more muted. Britain, Australia, Canada and the United States above all have these big lobbies that are, uh, you know, where businessmen pour in, you know, millions or even a uh, few billion dollars to campaign against the climate. So in these, uh, the rather weak need sort of uh, response of governments has been to try to persuade these sections that there should be climate action. Last point you were talking about the uh, lobby, business lobby, which is doing climate denial funding. Koch brothers, as well as now, a lot of the oil companies' records are now there in public domain who have been funding climate denial in a big way. It's also interesting, the Koch brothers are also the one find, uh, funding uh, extremely right-wing uh, politics in the United States. It's a strange mixture of climate denial and writing politics. I think uh, uh, certainly in the US context, right-wing politics is increasingly going with uh, uh, their own version of uh, the recourse to unreason. So, you know, it's a hallmark of the right-wing. I think everywhere their recourse to unreason and a particular version of that in the U.S. context, you see, you know, the, uh, the sort of very uh, strange uh, debate on abortion that takes place in a, a nation which is arguably the scientific, still the scientific powerhouse of the world. And so similarly on climate, there is this, uh, see, they have reached, for instance, in agriculture, a very particular situation, peculiar thing. American farmers, and this is borne out by the US EPA study of climate change impacts on agriculture, which I have written about, uh, which I have reviewed, and they are very sensitive to weather variability, you know, because a lot of commercial farming, markets, products, the whole, you know, how, you know, they have to cope with weather risk. So farmers are extremely sensitive to weather risk. But climate is something which does not seem, they do not appear to be able to see the connection. Thank you very much, Jair Abed, to have you with us. We'll keep looking at examining the climate change issues and also the aftermath when it happens of the Paris negotiations. Thank, Thank you. you.